Uh, but again, let us know if you do have any questions, everybody with the volunteer badges. Uh, so we have two excellent keynotes for you this morning. Um, not only were we able to draw a huge crowd, but a lot of interest from incredible experts in the field. So I'm really, really excited to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Roy Fielding. He's a senior principal scientist at Adobe Systems. He's best known for his work in developing and defining the modern World Wide Web. No big deal. Uh, he's the primary architect of the current hypertext transfer protocol, also known as HTTP, uh, co-author of the internet standards for HTTP, uniform resource identifiers, and URI templates. And if that wasn't enough, he's the co-founder of the Apache Software Foundation. Dr. Fielding received his PhD degree in information and computing science from the University of Californ California, Irvine. Thanks so much. So, um, I, it's, well, thank you. It's, it's great to be back here in Ottawa. I, uh, what I didn't include in my, my bio was that the first job I had back in, uh, first real software job that I had um, in 1985, I was here installing the, the dispatch system for CTCRO um, for, the, for the Hull Transit Authority. So whenever you, if you can remember back that far, the, uh, um, there's a phone number that you dial up for the, the uh, um, uh, bus stops it's to prevent your, you know, they'll give you the sorted next three s buses for that stop, and that's the software I wrote. That's, <laughs> that's saved a lot of frozen butts. Yeah. Um, okay, so I, I did a lot of stuff with the web, but right now I work for Adobe, and a lot of you may be wondering why, why is an Adobe person talking about open source? <laughs> you know, and, and the fact is that we actually do a lot of open source within Adobe and outside of Adobe, in the in the sense that um, of all these, you know, most people think of Adobe as a uh, proprietary box software company because that's what it was for 20 years, um, and roughly eight years ago um, they acquired the small Swiss company called Day Software. Um, that I was working for that was primarily building um, a, 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 a proprietary uh, web content management system called CQ. Let's see if this is going to work. Ah, yeah. Um, and we had a very small team. We only had um, 100 people in the company as a whole at the time. And I was in New Jersey, I mean Newport Beach in California, and um, most of the, the technical team was in Basel in Switzerland. And we had to find a way to build our software using a fairly small team and um, using uh, all the, uh, the capabilities of a modern software system, because this is, this is software that's supporting the largest websites in the world. And um, what we, what we did was take advantage of uh, the leverage that you can find within open source uh, communities in the sense that um, almost all of the software that we were developing has as, as its base actual open source projects, mostly at the Apache Software Foundation. And uh, we used that as the means to get the benefits of open source development along with the, uh, wh while also building a proprietary system. Um, uh, just outside the reach. Why don't you just go ahead. Um, so this concept of, of building an open source system and uh, wanting to do open development is, is very important because I, I think it's central to the idea of, of doing um, open first, in my opinion. Um, and that's that we want to focus on the ability to, to do open development. We want that um, the, the collaborative open source development to be emphasizing community over code. And the reason I say that is that as, as much as people think of software systems as being a bunch of code that people write in a corner and it's done, that's not the reality of, of how you build software. I mean, you, there's a huge uh, connection between 
the people who are using the software, the people who are building the software, the people who document the software, the people who try to understand it over time, use it over time, evolve that software over time. That is all community. And if you can't build a community, the software dies. And it doesn't matter, matter whether it's open source or closed source, it will still die. Um, because there's no such thing as an open source project that, that people can come in from the outside and start maintaining it from scratch without having that understanding. Uh, so, let's see if that works this time. So this, there's also this notion of, of Conway's Law. Conway's Law is something that um, it was an early software engineering, actually an organizational notion. Um, but it was back in 1968, Melvin Conway coined it as uh, when, when organizations build software, they end up building software that reflects the communication structure that they have. So if you have five or six different departments or teams working on a piece of software, they tend to build five or six components that only talk to each other in the same way that the teams talk to each other. So that's, it's, it's a, we, we call it a law because there's no way to escape it. It's just the way people um, behave and therefore the software that, that they design. No matter what kind of system you design, it's always going to have that kind of that interface. But if you think of it the other way around, um, a, a corollary to that is if you really want to do open development, if you want to have people do successful open source in a government setting or in a, in a private sector setting, um, you need to recognize that it's bound by those communication rules. And you need to forcefully architect the system so that it reflects the open development you want. You can't just walk in and adapt the community to the system. It doesn't work because people don't adapt that way. Uh, but if you forcibly architect the system with the understanding that open first is your, is your priority, that, that open development is what you want, then you can have much more success. Yes. So this is this notion of architecting for open development. And, that, and this is the... Um, the key strategy we've used at Adobe for our enterprise project products for the last eight years, developing from you know, both the, what's now called AEM, used to be CQ5, uh, but also into our, our now cloud services where most of our software is delivered or um, operated upon within cloud services, the Creative Cloud, Document Cloud, um, and uh, some AI software as well. It's all using open source software as its base. For the most part, we are uh, trying to participate as much as possible in the public forums to do things that, that, that we can work on in common, while at the same time providing services to our customers, um, just like the government provides services to citizens. Okay, go ahead. Um, so the first phase of that is, th there's really the three phases of, let's see if I can, oh, no, yeah, why don't you go back, go back one more. Okay. So there's three phases, really, or, or I, I can never come up with the right term for this. Because the, the, these are really codependent pedestals that, upon which we, race, we base our software. Um, it's open source, open standards, and open architecture. Uh, those are all important. Uh, in, for the, in, in terms of open source, it uses, you know, open source project use um, standards, open standards, in a very specific way, in the sense that most people think of, of, of the, the popular open source projects like Apache and Linux and Mozilla um, these are projects that are really devoted to sustaining a particular standard. And the reason that happens, that codependence happens, is partly be because in a social group of developers, because we're all doing our, our own communication and trying to make decisions within our own teams, um, within open source, you need a way to decide things. It's actually very difficult when you're not in a uh, corporate environment or a, 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 a traditional management environment 
where people can look to their boss and say, should I do this or should I do that? Uh, and the boss says, well, I want you to do this first and then maybe do that. You don't have that in, in, in a true open source project. You have to decide for yourself what it is you're going to do, and the group as a whole needs to decide whether they want to approve that as, as part of the next product. And because of that, open source tends to do very well when you're working towards a, sp a specific open standard. Because then you have a reference that the community can agree on, even if they don't think it's correct. So they can agree that, um, agree to implement pr towards a particular direction, while at the same time, perhaps even the same people are editing the standard so that it reflects the direction they want it to go. But because there is that sort of, um, oh, let's work for it, the way to evaluate your future behavior by looking at this separate artifact, um, it provides that nice uh, uh, driver. Oh, why don't you just go? The, uh, so, so we do open source. This is just the open standards that we've developed within our team. Um, we're very active. Uh, it's important not only to be active in de developing software, you also have to develop the standards to go with it. Um, and probably just go. The next thing, I don't know, some people can see it. Um, the, uh, the standards allow for uh, that vendor neutral uh, aspect of the software. So once you have uh, you, the open source is supporting standards, and then the, uh, the presence of standards allows the community to then start thinking about um, how do we support vendor independence? How do we get many different companies involved in larger and larger aspects of the, of the products? And it's very important in terms of building a larger ecosystem, particularly when you have um, a wide variety of contexts in which you might want to use the software. So some people may be building a very small informational site. Other people may be um, building uh, a very huge, complex, uh, multi-organizational support or, you know, system. So uh, this notion of, of being able to support that through open architecture, which is something that open standards enables. And it's not just today's system. Uh, open architecture is, is, is a way of designing systems so that they can evolve independently over time. And this is the, the key aspect of, of all the, the, the most popular open source projects like the Apache server has its modules, Linux kernel has its modules, uh, Firefox has its extensibility framework, at least when it started. Um, all of these very successful open source projects have been built on the basis of open architecture. Next one. Um, and, and AM's the same way. AM uses the, the, uh, the open architecture that um, was developed via OSGI, um, it's something IBM took from the car industry for, for building automobile software and adapted it to create the Eclipse um, interactive development environment. Um, so if you've ever seen Eclipse, Eclipse is actually using a plugin framework that consists of a plugin, uh, a plugin manager plus a, a million different plugins you can add to it. And we took that same thing and used it on the server side. We, we developed a server side framework for, for running Java systems using a plugin of plugin framework. So everything in the very large system, which is AEM, is actually can, can be managed via a, an OSGI console that you can plug in and plug out uh, components. Most of the, those components are actually open source components that are straight out of the ASF. And finally, the third leg is really um, that having that open architecture enables that co collaboration through independent extensibility. And the importance, I can't under, understate what the importance of the uh, independent extensibility is. The independent extensibility means that the core team that is developing a, a particular open source project, you know, like, like the Apache server, which I'm fam most familiar with, uh, can remain focused on just the core software. And other people can extend it to support particular application spaces, particular application domains or customers, 
uh, individual uh, interesting projects that they might be working on. And that is what turns a, a regular old piece of software into a fantastic um, multi-decade project like, like the HTTP server. And it's true of every one of those. The, if you go through all the uh, open source projects that people describe as the, the, the wonders of open source, that, that is the case of all of them. Whereas almost all other open source projects are single time published source code bases which are never looked at it again. So 99% of open source software that you find on things like GitHub is all software that people have published but there's no community for it. There's no liveness of it. There's no extensibility of the software other than cut and paste. And so it's, it's, um, it's really important to keep in mind, it's particularly if you're, if you're embarking on uh, a state where you want to do wide-scale collaboration within the Canadian government, um, you want to focus on things that enable you to maintain systems over time, and that means building on an open architecture. So, uh, like I said, we do our, our uh, open source development directly within the Apache Software Friend Foundation. This is our old slide. Um, the, the ASF is now over 340 or so primary uh, top level projects, uh, including almost all of the big data software that, that uh, is published, uh, most of the Java based web, web framework <coughs> software. Um, and some of the best um, software that's out there. So if you haven't been to the Apache website, I uh, encourage people to do so. Uh, unfortunately, we, they had, we just had the Apache conference in Montreal this week, which I missed because I thought I would avoid a trip to Canada. <laughs> and then I end up here anyways. But uh, I, I should have, I sh if I had planned in advance, I could have been at both. Oh, so we actually do development inside, for our AEM products, we do it at Apache. It's just that we call it, we, we're doing it as, as open source there. So we don't, we don't talk about AEM at all, really. We try to avoid it. We bring in some of our customer problems and we don't tell, them, tell the open source community where or who uh, found the bug, things like that, because unless the customer volunteers that, we, we, we we sort of filter it, um, but we work as peers in a larger team of, of many different companies. So what that provides us, it provides us a much wider scope in terms of ability to anticipate problems in our software, the ability to anticipate change over time. So particularly as, as platforms like operating systems change and they, and they will frequently come to Apache projects and tell the project that, hey, your system doesn't build on our software, on our, on our platform anymore because of this change to our operating system. Why don't you go ahead and fix that now? And six months from now, we'll release the actual version. Now, that, that's the kind of thing that, that proprietary companies never see because even a company like Adobe doesn't get a heads up warning that, that um, the underlying platforms are going to change. We have to fix them after the fact. But open source, the, the, uh, the operating systems and other platforms can actually run it on top and see problems before we do. And they participate just like everyone else. So more projects that we've run. And, and I say we, we don't just work at Apache, we also build open source uh, and publish it on GitHub ourselves. Um, the reason we do some of it on GitHub and some on Apache is because Apache is only for collaborative vendor neutral projects. Um, it, they take much longer to set up and they require a lot more uh, companies to, to get involved to even start an Apache project. Um, whereas on GitHub we can just throw up the code just like anyone else. Um, it, makes it makes the code available to all of our customers but isn't as satisfying as having a, a real Apache project, at least not for me. Um, and of course, even when we're internally at Adobe, uh, we use all of the same open source practices that we do at Apache. Uh, we have 18,000 employees, almost 15,000 I think are engineers. And we have to communicate around the world uh, 24 hours a day about uh, the, the topics of each of our, our, our uh, project, products. There's no way we can have a meeting which all of our developers can attend. 
Um, so we do the same, use the same principles. We, we um, use the same software for the most part. Uh, we use Jira as an issue management system. We do agile development. Um, we take advantage of the, uh, uh, all the tools and techniques that we've learned doing open source development in, for our internal projects internally within Adobe as well. Um, and this is basically the various aspects of AEM that take use of that. Uh, so that's, this is the main thing that I wanted to get across is, is it's not just open source, it's open architecture, open standards, and open source that work together and support each other in, in providing these, these, these great projects. One more? Okay. Now, uh, I'm not sure if they invited me to do so, but somebody wrote on the slide, that, can you go back one? Um, the, uh, that, that I should give my opinion on, on the open first strategy and, and things like that. Uh, so I have this one slide that I added last night with trepidation, but. Um, so I, I, I've been following this a little bit because uh, we, we do have an office in Ottawa and, and we have um, a, you know, a lot of uh, interaction with the Canadian government in terms of, of supporting uh, web products. Um, particularly like the Canada.ca is, is support, is running on top of uh, an instance of AM. Um, not not, it's not actually using all the capability of AM, but it's running in, uh, on that platform. And I, I just want to say, I, I read through the, the most recently reduced digital standards, and they're great. I mean, they really cover all the bases in terms of, of what, you know, to focus on what, how to get started on this process. And I really think that that will help in terms of getting um, the development out there soon. Um, I have a little more concern with the not yet finished yet, um, oh, the, the, the white paper. Um, mo it's, it's obviously going in the right direction and, and, and very well considered. If anything, there's too much consideration um, in the sense that there's a lot of attempts to explain and define open source, which would be awesome if it was 100% correct. But it's almost impossible to <laughs> describe open source. Open source is different in every single project that uses it. Open source is a, is a result of a social process. It's, it's a result of the people who were involved. So if you talk to Richard Solomon, for example, with the Free Software Foundation, and you ask him about open source, and first he'll tell you, that, no, it's not, it's not open source, it's free software. But after, if you get past the point where he's telling you it's free software, he has a totally different view of what he's doing and why he's doing it than other software developers who are publishing open source. And that's great. There's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that. He's got a particular thing he's, he's moving towards. He's using copyright. Um, oh, by the way, I should say copyleft as described in the pa white paper isn't quite what it was described. Copyleft isn't giving up rights. It's a coercion method to ensure that the, us the end users have the same rights. So it's, it's, uh, there's not, th right. Anyway, it's a very complicated notion in terms of, 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 of what it means and why it's there, and it has a huge history. And oh my God, I don't want to relive in most of it. But um, so, what I would encourage people there's a lot of stuff about open source in the open for, in the open first white paper, which really should be a reference to some other document or a reference to the history of OSI, a reference to licensing facts. You know, not it's not the important thing. And whatever the government of Canada does, they're not going to change the nature of open source. So don't define it in the white paper. Um, the other thing, let's see, I'm sorry. Um, it's like licensing and, and um, distributed version control systems. There's, there's a, a real brief, brief note in there saying the future of version control is distributed DVCS. And I'm thinking, oh, no. oh. Um, DVCS is like Git uh, in the sense that you have Git and, and subversion, different version control systems. They both have their own attitude uh, and Added and benefits. Uh, distributed version control systems allow people to work offline and pr primarily enable it so that individual patch, individual maintainers of the software um, 
can process changes and apply them to their copy and then distribute that as a copy. That, that, it's, it's, it does what uh, Linus Torvalds wanted for a, a content management system. There's a lot of benefits to that. But the real benefit of Git is GitHub. It's not, D, it's not the distributed nature of, of DVCS. It's the social interaction you get at GitHub. And that's because it's a centralized, author-driven platform. It's not a distributed platform. Yeah, it's using a dis distributed control system, but it's a centralized platform. Um, it's a, the same with Subversion. The advantage Subversion has is it is centralized version control, so the team always knows what they're working on. The disadvantage is, is that it's more painful to manage as an individual administrator. So they have positives and benefits. There is no reason for the white paper to decide one or the other. So um, I, I, I would encourage folks who are working on that to, to focus a little more on the problems of Government of Canada. F identify the barriers to open source and open source adoption and open development in particular. Eliminate them. <laughs> you know, focus on how, how, do I, how do we eliminate those barriers in government and the rest will, will follow from that. Um, also, be true to yourselves in terms of, of what the government of Canada is. I mean, it's a government. You, the government has great powers and great responsibilities. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what the constraints are in Canada, but I'm sure there's something like they are in the, in the states. Um, there are lots of things that government simply cannot do because there are laws against it. You have to accept that and you have to work within it. Um, and that's, that's a, unique, a unique situation that regular open source projects don't have to deal with. Um, and, and the final bit is open source is not a, not a religion. Um, some people may treat parts of open source as a religion, but it really that's not what it's for. The, the, the source code part of it is to get it in the hands of all the people who you want to collaborate with and to be able to collaborate over time. The, the religion, if anything, is this notion of open collaboration, that you can get better products by working together instead of working in tiny cubbies. Um, and and the, the final thing, as, as a tool developer myself, I have to point out that most of the open source developers don't actually write their own systems from scratch, except for the bits they're collaborating on. If they're collaborating on a project, that's where they build their own and publish it as open source. If they're using a laptop, they use a Macintosh, like, like other people. They, they use a, a Mac laptop that has a lot of proprietary mixed with open source in it. It gives them a lot of the ability to, to extend it. It has a Unix operating system in size, a lot of extensibility. Um, but they're buying it from a vendor because that is a professional tool. And they want to have the best tool to support the work. Last one. And that, it's that simple notion. You know, even the do-it-yourselfers don't start out by rebuilding power tools. They, they don't build their own chainsaw. Um, you might need to build a, a specialized tool for a specific job. Or you might have to pay, pay a contractor to build one for you. So you do need the ability to reflect and extend over time. But you don't start out by, by doing it all from scratch. Pick the things that the government is focused on and able to solve first and do those using whatever the best tool you can find, whether it be open source or proprietary. Always go for the best. That's it. Thank you. Thank you so much.